Well, good morning. I hope I'm not too loud, maybe a little bit loud, because I'm going to get louder. <laughs> I would turn me down a bit if I was you. Thank you. Well, happy Mother's Day. It's a challenge to incorporate a Mother's Day message into what we've just read, Isaiah 53. So I'm not going to try. <laughs> I can see Ron Harris's mind thinking about, how can I incorporate that into the message? So thank you for coming this morning. And to all you mothers here who work tirelessly on behalf of their families, bless you all. Amen. This is the fifth week of the book of Isaiah. And today we turn to the most loved and famous chapters in the whole of Scripture, Isaiah 53. <clears throat> Isaiah is a masterpiece of literature. It's part narrative, history, songs, poetry, prophetic. It's been described as an oracle, like a song, singing out the story of Israel. And it is Yahweh's character, the only true God, which is the central theme of this book of grandeur and majesty. Isaiah 53, I would term prophetic poetry. As with many chapters, it has memorable lines. I'm sure many of you can quote by heart. Poetry, it's such a beautiful genre in the Bible, for it tells truth in a way that we can remember, in a way that gives us vivid pictures, expanding our imagination. These are truths that demand our attention. Isaiah can be astonishingly healing as we heard last week, and unbearably harsh. It should be read with our hands held out, open to the Spirit of God to reveal where you are in these ancient words. We approach it with a humble, open heart and let God speak to you personally. You and I are in the book. Let's pray. And so, Father, as we've read these famous words, they could be so familiar to us. Help, them, help us not to think about that, but to actually read them, soak them in, and speak to our hearts this morning. We pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Chapter 53 is also interpreted in different ways. The traditional Jewish view of this chapter is that the servant mentioned is the nation of Israel. After all, there are passages that explicitly say that the servant is Israel. But from the early Christian church perspective, the servant is the anointed one, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, with the graphic references to torture and agony that would be witnessed in execution by means of crucifixion. Now, just in case you're wondering if Isaiah 53 was in the original text, we also have the story of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, who was reading and quoted Isaiah 53 in his chariot when Philip was commissioned to go and meet with him. And Philip explained this passage and many other Old Testament passages as fulfilled prophecy through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we also have the Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered in 1947, which had among their thousands of fragments and documents two fall manuscripts of Isaiah, dated way before Christ, and they both contained Isaiah 53. Isaiah was written some 
several hundred years before Christ. And it's poignant that the opening verse of chapter 53 begins, who has heard this message? The eunuch certainly heard the message and wanted to be baptized on the spot. The writer is expecting an answer. Are you awake? Are you breathing? Good. Listen to the message. Pay attention. I'm watching you. We have heard over the past weeks that the message will fall on deaf ears and blind sight. Isaiah is commissioned to go and preach in chapter 6. JB covered this as our first session. The Lord said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Yet despite the obstinacy of the people, the Lord sends Isaiah to preach and warn them of the judgment to come. He sends Isaiah. He is recognized as one of the best, if not the best orator in the Old Testament, a major prophet. What does that tell you about Yahweh, the God of the Bible? Even to the spiritually deaf and the blind, he sends his best. God's love for us does not give up. The message is too important. It's the key to life, and the story has to be told. Perhaps you've been praying for years for family members, for neighbors, perhaps even for nations, that they would hear the report, that they would recognize the truth of this chapter in Isaiah, that by his stripes we are healed. Like our God, don't give up praying. Keep praying. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, you can do an in-depth study of the arm of the Lord, You've, from Abraham to Israel's rescue, from Pharaoh to David's Psalms. And now in Isaiah, in various chapters, we read, the arm of the Lord will rule for him. Gentiles, put your hope in the arm of the Lord. The arm redeems, brings salvation. For the Christian, the arm of the Lord is the Jesus Christ who brings salvation. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This message, this revelation that God is doing something new must be heard. The Lord is on the move. But this movement is not one that we expect. You would expect the power of God to come down from heaven to defeat the evil enemies, smash their armies, restore uh, peace from Jerusalem from Jerusalem as the center going out. But Isaiah 53 declares that this new thing that God is doing is the exact opposite of our expectations. Through the Christian lens, it is God who suffers. Through the Jewish lens, it is Israel who suffers. The suffering servant is the way to overcome the evil in the world. How can that be? Surely suffering is misery that leads to a dead end future. Yet the report that we are asked to believe in is declaring that suffering produces glory. Jew or Christian agree we can put that on the screen, that this passage of Scripture declares that God is doing something new and it is through suffering that glory will result. And as we look at the suffering servant, let's not preempt the traditional Jewish outlook that the suffering servant is Israel. We can learn a lot from the rabbi who would look at this passage through the eyes of the nation through the eyes of the surrounding nations. It's a corporate interpretation. We, all like lost sheep, have gone astray. This, they would say, is referring to Israel and the surrounding nations. 
Now, the second half of Isaiah, I don't have time to explain why there's a second half, but the second half of Isaiah from chapter 40 to, to the end of, 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 of the book, uh, Israel has gone through this exile period. And so they understand, they're looking back, they understand why God judged them after centuries of warning. They're so corrupt, so far removed from what they were called to be. As Paul Yo spoke a couple of weeks ago, God withdrew his protection. His arm came down, and evil swept in and took them away. Israel was smitten and afflicted, crushed, judged, pierced, and they know it, sitting in their own ashes, weeping by the rivers of Babylon. They have been smitten beyond recognition. The effects of God's chosen nation fallen away from God, it's devastating. It's as if the nation takes on its own identity and becomes its own sort of evil force. It's interesting that, you know, the scriptures talk about us battling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And the powers of the nations rebel against God, and the result is chaos. When any nation chooses to move away from God, then the weak are taken advantage of. Oppression will follow. All kinds of circumstances will affect their lives. It just affects their lives and devastates their lives for generations. It is the sin of tyranny. We evangelicals in the West... We see the world, the world in a sort of a guilt-innocent lens. We define sin as choice and humanity as guilty. It is that. That is true. But you cannot complete the whole picture with just that outlook, that sin is choice and humanity is guilty. Because when you have power and you abuse it, you create sin as tyranny and humanity as victim. Right here, I mean, just right here in our congregation, we have Sudanese brothers and sisters who have been forced to migrate and have come to freeze in Canada when their soul is in Sudan. Is that their fault? Are they guilty? No. They are victims of tyranny. Think of those in slavery, those who are being trafficked. Sinner's choice? No. Victims of sinner's tyranny, changing lives for generations. It would make an interesting study, would it not, when we look through the, the lens of tyranny and victim. Did Bathsheba have a choice when King David took her? Because he could. Why wasn't the woman at the well who had an encounter with Jesus, why wasn't she condemned? Because she wasn't. Israel never practiced the year of Jubilee, where all property would return to its original owner after 50 years. The wealthy kept it, and the poor got poorer. God was so disgusted with Israel's failure to look after the widows and the orphans, and their determination to worship idols, that their sacrifices were detestable to him, and Israel became sin as tyranny. We in Nova Scotia have a plank in our own eye, do we not? In our own history, here in Nova Scotia, how the Aboriginal peoples were treated, how the black community was treated, how the French were treated, are examples. How about residential schools? All are tyrannical stories, and the fallout of that is seen today in so many cultural problems. When the rabbi looks at Isaiah 53 through the lens of the nations, we cannot ignore the devastation of nations failing and sin as tyranny. Parallel that with the view, the Christian view, 
of Isaiah 53, that we as individuals have chosen to go our own way, we have transgressed against others, against ourselves and against God, which is sin as choice and humanity as guilty. Layer that with the sin as tyranny and humanity as victim, and you have a much more comprehensive understanding of the depth of the brokenness of the world. I mean, how do you solve that? How do you fix that? I hope you can see that we cannot solve the depths of such chaos. And the message of Isaiah is that Yahweh has acted and is doing something new that is big enough to overcome sin and evil in all its manifestations. God cannot wink or ignore sin and evil. It must be confronted and defeated. God's character demands it. Our justice demands it. Why do the wicked prosper, says the psalmist? It is through the suffering servant that justice will be met. We are spared the sentence of death. By his stripes we are healed. The driving force of this action is God's love for you and me. He won't abandon us. He's coming after us. What a message. The servant's manifesto is laid out in Isaiah 61, and I think we can put that up on the screen. <clears throat> no, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And take that one off, it's okay. We're familiar with it anyway. We could probably recite it together off by heart. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the... We could say victims as well, right? And release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This was the manifesto that Jesus read out at the beginning of his ministry. He had come to break the powers of sin and darkness and evil, the captives, the prisoners set free from darkness. He fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 53 as the suffering servant. And the suffering is horrific. Jesus is all over this passage. Can you see him too? We'll put up on the screen the suffering servant. He, the servant, was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And we read the, the, first, the last few lines of chapter 52 because there it says, just as there were many who were appalled at him, the suffering servant, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and the kings will shut their mouths because of him for what they were not told they will, they will see and what they have heard not heard, they will understand. The suffering was so great, marred beyond human likeness, but the nations and the kings couldn't take their eyes off him, their mouths shut because of him. Here, the servant, 
almost of no consequence from a human perspective. But out of his suffering comes glory. So let's read on at verse 10. Yet it was the Lord to crush him. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offering, glory, and prolong his days, glory, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand, glory. After this, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied, glory. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, glory, and he will bear their iniquities. There is a greater good. Out of this suffering comes great blessing. We will see it as we progress through the later chapters of Isaiah. We see it in Revelation 21 where heaven and earth come together. The suffering will bring glory. And we know that the suffering is indeed worth it. We will know that at the end. I really believe that our personal suffering can bring glory as well. Glory that points to the reality of what Christ has done for us. Just this week, our dear brother Bob Colburn passed away. He had a nasty fall. He had to have surgery. When he came out of surgery, he was asking the nurses, how are you doing? He was being a blessing to others, even in his suffering. He went on later to have a cardiac arrest, and we will miss him, but we know where he is. My brother-in-law's mother-in-law, it's a bit of a mouthful, was Dorothy Brunt. Dorothy Brunt passed away at the age of 95. She died with such peace the staff were deeply affected by her faith and the presence of God around her. I remember someone saying to me, Graham, 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 what we should do is we should build uh, a Christian resting home. And uh, so all the Christians can be together and suffer and die together. <laughs> no. 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 You know, whether you're old or whether you're young, the Lord does not promise to ease our suffering, but to be with us as we go through it, thereby being a witness that Jesus indeed journeys with us. I see Sean Emmanuel here. Sean's been very sick with cancer. Brother, you suffer with the Lord. He will bless you. He to bless others. Ralph, I see you're hobbling around. You're not getting younger, right? In our suffering, we can bless others. others. And I pray that the Sudanese community here and others who have been displaced by tyranny will see their pain turn into glory. Because what God has meant for evil, Jesus can turn to good. Hmm. It says here, take a drink. <laughs> but it's important, is it not, when we read these powerful words, this passage that takes us into the mystery of the suffering servant, that we understand, we need to understand as much as we can about the gospel. Indeed, Isaiah has been termed the fifth gospel behind Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have already seen that the chaos brought on the world by tyrannical and individual sin, it's just unsolvable. It cannot possibly be solved by human effort. The only God's intervention can cure the problem. We have also seen in the book of Isaiah that when Isaiah stands before the throne of God, he knows he cannot be there. He says, woe is me. I'm ruined. 
For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory. Now, I don't think Isaiah is a bad guy. I think, you know, I think if he was in our congregation, he'd be an elder. We might let him speak from time to time. He's a good guy. A little intense, maybe, but he's a good guy. And if he knows that he is ruined, I'm in trouble. And you're in trouble. I'm going to put up a quote from Daryl Johnson. It's out of his book of Revelation, but it fits so perfectly into Isaiah. Through the world's view, the world's glasses, the events of life would point otherwise, but you go to that throne and submit to it, you will begin to see things differently. The imagery tells us why we must pay attention. The imagery tells us why we dare not play games with God. We are dealing with sheer greatness. When we approach the control center of the universe, everything is open, above board, clear, and clean. No deceit, no games, no duplicity, no double messages, no manipulation. In the throne room, we cannot but be changed. Proverbs 9.10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The respect, the reverence, trying to grasp the sheer awe of God is the beginning of wisdom. Do we understand that? Hebrews 9.10 says it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that is why Isaiah speaks about Yahweh being holy more than any other in the Old Testament. In fact, just to emphasize it in Isaiah, he says it three times before he stands before the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. We pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. So on the one hand, sinful man cannot be in the presence of a holy God. Isaiah shows us that. And yet we find in Revelation 21 that when God puts all things right, when the suffering has turned to full-on glory, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he, God, will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Isaiah 53 spells it out so clearly that suffering will produce glory. Where could we, where could we not stand in the presence of God? Now we can. Where we could not stand in the presence of God, now we can. Full access to God because Christ suffered for us. Now we need to be careful that this good news is not only about forgiveness of sins, as central as that is. Dallas Willard is a wonderful philosopher and theologian, passed away a few years ago, calls calls that gospel, if it's just about forgiveness of sin, he calls that the gospel of sin management. Some Christians have seen the cross as transactional or formulaic experience, coming to Christ and looking to heaven after you die. It's not to say they aren't sincere. They recognize that it's only by faith, by the grace of God, that they can come to the foot of the cross and ask forgiveness. This is fundamental, as we have already noted. Repentance is the birthplace of a new beginning. But, the, but that gospel is too small. The Great Commission goes deeper than that. The Great Commission says, go into the world and make disciples. So you start this beginning at the cross through faith, coming to the cross, the place of repentance. It's like the throne room of Isaiah. Like Isaiah, we receive forgiveness and we are commissioned to embark on a journey of transformation empowered by the Spirit of God, changing you to bless others. We are to become the aroma of Christ. Dallas Woodard puts it this way. We can put it up on the screen. His definition of the gospel? Put your confidence in Jesus and live with him as his disciples now in the present kingdom of God. 
Isaiah 53 instills such confidence. God is doing something new. The suffering servant will be crushed for our transgressions and iniquities. Justice demands it. We are healed by his stripes. The punishment that was due to us was laid on him. Put your confidence in that and then continue having confidence. As the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 1.6, it says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen.